things are not always as they are perceived. The same is true, I believe, in leadership. Sometimes I think we blow leadership up to be this big, overwhelming type of thing. And in fact, I truly believe that leadership is simple. It's very hard, but it's simple. I think the concepts of leadership are simple. And I think there are some simple things that we can begin to do, even though they're hard, starting tomorrow to become a better leader. That's my whole goal. And I found that basically, people will follow you for two basic reasons. Now, there's lots, of, there's lots of peripheral issues on why they might follow you, but there's two basic reasons on which people will follow you, in which they will make their decisions, either conscious or subconscious, on whether or not they are going to allow you to influence them. See, everybody makes a decision. Your followers are con constantly making decisions, whether they're uh, conscious or subconscious. Am I going to allow this person to influence me, or to what degree am I going to allow this person to influence me? The two primary reasons that I've found, and other people have, have confirmed with me, on which people make this decision on whether others will be allowed to influence them, two things. Number one, your skills. People want to know that your skills are further ahead of them because they want to become like you. They want to move toward you. They want to, to grow into that same level in which your skills have grown to. The second reason is your character. People will follow you based on your skills and your character. And it cannot be one without the other. Now think about that for a moment. What if you have tremendous character and bad skills? What are you? You're a nice guy. I might invite you over to the Super Bowl, watch the party with me, you know, watch the, the, the game with me, eat chips with me. I might invite you over for dinner. I might let you watch my kids. But I, you're probably not going to be a leader because I'm always going to have this question about your skills. Great character, wonderful person, great human being, probably not a leader. What if, on the other hand, you have tremendous skills and very poor character? What are you? You're basically a charlatan. Now, the insidious thing about this matchup here is that you will be able to lead for a while. Because people will follow your skills for a while, but eventually the, the, the undercurrent or the rotting of the character underneath will make those people, even though your skills are good, will make them basically say, I, I don't know. I don't know about that person. I don't know if I trust that person. Because isn't the agreement between a leader and a follower, I will take you here. And the follower has to make a decision. Will he really take me there? Will she really take me there? Is he really telling the truth? Is she really telling the truth? Can that person really take me there? And it comes down to a trust issue. Do they trust your character? Let's start with the skills. Now the first skill set that we're going to talk about is communication. Now you might say, well, that's, you know, that's something that everybody says, and what do you mean by communication? There's something very specific that I want to talk to you about in, in regard to communication. Most of you who are leaders are go-getters. That's what I found about leaders, are go-getters. One of the things about leaders and about go-getters is that you can pretty much just, if you even have to tell them at all, you only have to tell them once, hey, can we get this done? But it's different with followers. One of the problems that we have as leaders is that we communicate to followers who aren't necessarily go-getters as though we ourselves would want to be communicated to. So, uh, like for me, if you, if you want me to get something done, give it to me once, don't harangue me on it, I want, I'll get it done for you. I'm great at getting tasks done. And so I tend to communicate that way. You probably find yourself doing the very same thing. You say it once and then when it doesn't happen, you say, well, why isn't this happening? Now I want to talk to you a little bit about communication and the communication process and then draw some, uh, some ideas for us that you can apply starting tomorrow. But I want to go through the communication process just to drive home an idea with you that communication is not simple. You cannot just tell somebody something and expect them to get it. And then we're going to draw some very practical things out of it. When you have communication, you have... Um, how's that? That looks pretty good. Got an eye there. And then you got another person here, and they've got... Hey, that turned out actually pretty good. And um, you've got two people communicating, right? Now let's think through this communication process, because most of us as leaders, if we haven't thought through the communication process, we think to ourselves, um, well, I tell them, they hear, they do, and if, if they don't do, then, you know, we've got problems. It's, it's much more intricate than that. And one of the things that really helped me as a leader is when I realized the intricacy of it, 
and what I need to do to make sure that real, true communication takes place. The primary skill that you can learn is, uh, is communication. Where does communication start? I would say it starts in the heart, or it starts in the soul, or whatever you want to call it, that internal part of us that is emotion-driven. One of the best lessons I ever learned, I was sitting in the hot tub at the Sammamish Club in Issaquah, and this salesman, who, uh, a very sales-oriented guy, just sold his business for like $12 million. We were talking about the sales process. He said, Chris, learn this. Everybody makes decisions with their heart and justifies them with their logic. Everything is made in the decision level with their heart, how they feel about it, they justify it with logic. They love the smell of the leather and the sound of the roar of the engine, but they're always going to talk about gas mileage and torque. It starts in the heart. Now from the heart, where does it go in the heart? Then where does it go? Then it goes up into the mind, right? And the mind has to take the, the heart and has to put words to it and has to uh, put it into something that they can then begin to say. And you're, at every one of these levels, there's the possibility of breakdown, which is most easily demonstrated in the next uh, part here, which is it goes through the tongue. Now, how many times have you, you yourself said or you've heard somebody else say, you're trying to communicate, you say, I'm just not saying what I'm thinking. Now, doesn't that seem strange to you? I mean, it's your tongue, it's your brain, why can't you say what you're thinking? But there's a breakdown in the communication process at every single level. Now, from the tongue, and these are things are going to look really weird by the time we're done with them, but from the tongue, where does communication go? Where does it go? Ears. Almost every single person in these seminars says ears. It does not go into the ears. It goes into what I call circumstances. It goes to the circumstances. It's why if you tell one joke at a wedding, people will laugh. You tell the same joke at a funeral, people will say, that person's rude and I can't believe they said it. Same joke, same words. It's why if I were to invite you over to, uh, say, a, uh, a roasted pig, uh, maybe I'm going to roast a pig in the back, and I invite you over, you might say, that sounds like fun. Can I bring my kids? We'll have a, big, you know, have a great time. But if you're Jewish and I invite you over to a, a roasted pig, you'd have a different way of understanding it because of culture. Circumstances and the things that we communicate through have a direct effect. Now you might say, okay, put some legs on that, Chris, for work. What if somebody in your, in your uh, a group that you're leading is having marriage problems? And you're trying to get them to do something, you're trying to power them up, and they've got this major thing that's taking place at home that you may not even know about. All of that resides through here. The effective leader, the strong leader, the extraordinary leader is a person who's constantly refining their communication process so that they understand this isn't just about me saying the words, you hearing it in the ear, and then moving on and getting it done. We understand that there's this process, and at every single level there is the potential for breakdown. From the circumstances then, then we go into the ear. That's a great looking ear. Goes into the ear. Now what's the problem with the ear? You might not even hear it right. You might be saying things to the people who follow you, they may not even be hearing you right. Goes from the ear, where does it go from the ear? Goes into the mind. See, the human language that we use, the English language, has all these different meanings. Maybe what you're saying has a negative connotation to the person who's hearing it. And of course, from the mind then, it goes where? It goes down into the heart. Then they have to decide how they feel about it. And they will always make their decisions based on how they feel, and they'll justify it with logic. How do they feel about that? So you say, okay, Chris, what, what does all this mean? We've understood the process. We look at that, and it barely looks like anything I meant for it to look like. But what's the point? The point is, if you're going to be an extraordinary leader, you've got to take this issue of communication seriously. And I want to give you three different ways that you can do that. First of all, is just understand the difficulty of it, so that you will take it more seriously, so that as a leader you will understand that you cannot just simply flippantly say, we need to do this. You need to say, I need to make sure that this gets across in the manner in which I meant for it to get across. Because it's neither right nor wrong that a person doesn't understand or doesn't grasp or, or whatever the breakdown uh, happened. It just happened. Secondly, it is an issue that I, I learned primarily from uh, Professor Cotter at Harvard Business School. Uh, when he talks about it in his book, Leading Change, he said the average leader thinks that they over-communicate. How many of you have thought in yourself, man, I'm just beating this to death, 
right? You think, oh, I can't talk about it anymore. They're sick of listening to me. Through all the research, and, and, and I love reading his books because you know they've thrown the whole weight of corporate America and, and the, the money that Harvard Business School has to really do the research. He says the average leader under communicates by a ratio of one to a hundred. The average organization, if you're the CEO or the president or whatever the title is that's the leader of the organization, you might think you're beating a dead horse, and the fact is, is that you are probably under-communicating. You say, yeah, but I've talked about it ten times. One of the things that you can do to begin to process it and make sure your organization is getting the vision starting tomorrow morning is to communicate more often in more different ways. Maybe you communicate, and if you have four people that work under you, you ask them to communicate it twice a day, every day. Now you've implemented, you've got four people, and they're now doing it ten times a week. You're communicating 40 more times a week. You're getting it out there more and more. They might have five or six people underneath them, and you ask them to do it once a week. All of a sudden, you begin to multiply. You're sending the message and sending the message and sending the message, and you can start with that tomorrow. You can walk in there and say, I need to communicate this message. I need to get this message across. How can I do it? I can communicate more often through more different people. I can do it in more different ways. Memos, emails, I can put it on our website, we can make a video, whatever you need to do. How can you communicate it more and more and more to become more effective? And the last piece that I would say in terms of communication is, is to become a better listener. To become a better leader is often to become a better listener. When was the last time you sat down with the people who follow you and you asked them to give you feedback? One of the things that I've done uh, uh, oh, a few times over my career is I've sat down with the staff that served uh, with me. The last time was about five months ago. And I said, for the next hour, I'm going to sit here with a legal pad. And I'm going to give you one by one your opportunity to tell me what you think my strengths are, what you think my weaknesses are, what you think I'm doing right, what you think I'm doing wrong, what you think I should stop doing, and what you think I should never stop doing. And I said, I will only ask, very rarely, a, qualif a, a qualifying question. Like, okay, you said this, what do you mean by that? I will not give you any feedback, so your followers do not have to, they do not have to worry about, you know, the wrath of the boss saying, well, that's not right, I didn't. Could you do that? Could you let them give you this honest feedback to tell you about your leadership skills? It's one of the most effective things you could do. You could do that tomorrow. You could walk in and say, we're going to take an hour. I want to become a better leader. I went to this leadership seminar yesterday, and I figured the people who could give me the best feedback are my followers. We're going to sit here for an hour. i got a legal pad. Will you please tell me? The second is hard decisions. Make hard decisions. I think that leadership is almost defined by the hard decisions you make. If you don't ever make a hard decision, if you don't ever make a decision, you're not leading, you're following. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Because I've found that almost every single person I come in contact with has a hard decision that they're putting off. Now you say, what could I do tomorrow about hard decisions? Make one. You should make your decisions. And the reason you should make your decisions quickly is because if you put your decision off and it's wrong, what do you not have anymore? Time to correct it. If you make a decision early on and it's the right decision, it's the hard decision, you are that much further ahead. If you make the decision early on and it's the hard decision and you make that decision and it's the wrong decision, what do you have? Time to correct it. Here's my challenge to you today for tomorrow. I want you to literally right now pull out your pen and I want you to write down what is the hard decision that I have been putting off and write it down and I'd like to encourage you to make that decision tomorrow. To go in and to do it. Make the hard decisions. That's what leadership is about. If you're not willing to make the hard decisions, because it's usually the hard decisions that are going to move your organization on further and further. If you're not willing to make the hard decision, your organization is just going to stop. Because it's usually the hard decisions that you make that open up the organization and allow you to move to the very next level. What is that hard decision? I would encourage you by the end of tonight to sit down and to write down what time you will make it, what you will do and how you'll carry it out. Now the third skill that I want to talk to you about is execution. I'm talking about carrying out your plan. How many of you remember a couple years ago, uh, Fortune magazine did a cover article called Why CEOs Fail? They went out and they, they did all this research and they, they asked uh, CEOs and organizations and the VPs who served underneath of them, what were the components of your, of your overall uh, drive?